All right, so the question is what what are these, um, what is the origin of the substructures that you observe in these protoplanetary disks? So is it due to uh, a planet that is embedded in the disk or is it due um, to uh, other processes that will, um, that will cause planet formation? But today I'm not gonna talk to you about disks around young stars, but I'll tell you, uh, tell you about uh, uh, planets that are um, probably form around post main sequence stars. Okay, and so do we know some second generation planet candidates? Uh, so the answer is uh, yes, and today I'm not going to speak about planets around post stars, but I will speak about planets around low and intermediate mass stars. And one um, detection of such planets uh, was done around the Enhancer system. So the Enhancer is a binary eclipse and binary system with a wide dwarf and an end dwarf. And you can monitor the time of the eclipses uh, with, uh, uh, with the different uh, orbits. And you can see that the timing of these eclipses changes with, uh, with the orbit. And the change is very, very uh, small. It's the order of, uh, of a second, but it is detectable. And so you can monitor this uh, eclipse timing variations, and you can try to reproduce the, the, um, this data with a model of uh, two planets that are orbiting the binary. And so these two planets will exert a gravitational pull on the inner binary, and because of the light, travel time effect, you will have such a shift in the eclipse uh, timings. And so if you fit uh, the data up to 2011, you can see that the models of the two planets will predict uh, a strong shift in this, um, in this timing variations. And this target was since then followed up and the uh, observations are really following the prediction that is made by this uh, model with uh, two planets. So I think very, um, it's a very promising uh, uh, detection. And so in this model, there are two, uh, two massive uh, giant uh, planets that orbit the binary at three and uh, five astronomical units. The orbits are stable, and they were also analyzed to know if they could have uh, survived the giant phase of what is now a white dwarf. And uh, the result was that uh, the orbits would not be stable uh, during the, the gen phase. So it's unlikely that those planets are uh, from first generation. So it means that they were formed where the stars were young, but it's more likely that they were formed when the, uh, when the uh, after, just after or during the gen phase of the, of the white dwarf. And there was also a detection of dust by ALMA in the system that could be the leftover of the second generation protoplanetary uh, disks. So these are nice, nice candidates of, of such second generation planets, but do we know uh, candidates to be second generation protoplanetary disks? And of course we do. Uh, yeah, and we see them. I mean, I think the main candidates are the ones that we see around post-AGB uh, binaries. So the post-AGB phase in the life of, uh, of, a, of a star is a transition phase between the giant branches and the planetary nebula and white dwarf stages. As you can see here in the HK diagram, you have an um, evolutionary strike for, uh, for a, uh, a one star mass uh, a star. And you can see that the post HGB phase is the most luminous phase of the life of a, of a star. And it's thought to be relatively uh, short because this is uh, where the uh, asymptotic giant branch star loses its, uh, its, um, uh, its envelope, and there is just the, the core of the star that contracts and becomes very, very uh, hot and may uh, go through the planetary nebula phase. However, if you, this is for a single star, and so if you introduce a, a companion that is close enough, when the star, the more massive star will evolve and go through the giant uh, branches, it will, oops, it will have a very large uh, radius and star inter interact with its companion. So it can interact through tides, through winds, but also through rush of overflow. And maybe uh, it can go through uh, a common uh, envelope uh, evolution phase. So we don't know what, so there will be a very strong binary interaction that is not yet very well constrained. But what we know is that the result 
will give uh, will uh, produce a circumbinary disk in these targets, and we know that because we observe many of those circumbinary disks. We also start uh, to see uh, disk-like structures around AGB uh, AGB stars with ALMA, and so it, it's very promising because it could be the very first stage of the production of such a post-AGB uh, binary disk. But the link, the evolutionary ring between these AGB targets and the post-AGB targets is not yet established. Uh, uh, it's not yet clearly established that this is a research in progress. And we know 85 of those post-AGB binary uh, systems in the galaxy, so they are relatively uh, relatively uh, numerous, and we know about 200 in the LMC and uh, SMC. So I told you that there is a, um, a strong link between binarity and the presence of the disk, but I didn't tell you how do we know that. Um, and so if we look at post-AGB stars, so the single stars, but also binary stars, we can uh, observe the spectral energy distribution. So here have flux, again, the wavelengths in micron, and you see that the model of the photosphere is in black. And in the infrared, you have an infrared excess. But you have two kinds of ex excesses. You have a shell-like excess, like a second black body that is due to the dust that is located at one single uh, um, distance from the star, like in a shell, and that emits at, the, at a given temperature that will produce a black body excess. That's, that's why we call that the shell-like excess. And you have a disk-like excess that is uh, due to different black bodies at different temperatures uh, that emit in the infrared. And if you put dust in the disk, you will obtain this kind of excesses. And what was done is that those targets were uh, monitored with radial velocity to look for companions. And uh, we cannot detect any companions around uh, shell-like uh, sources. So they are all single and almost all of the disk uh, like sources are uh, binary. So there is a stellar companion that is around the disk sources. So there is a very strong link, observational link between the presence of a disk and the presence of a companion. Another interesting feature of this uh, post-AGB binaries is that there is a chemical depletion on the surface of the post-AGB star. So if we measure the abundance on the surface of the post-AGB star, uh, of the post-AGB star, sorry, so we have the abundance here on the y-axis and the condensation temperature of each different element on the x-axis, we can see that there is a depletion of refractory elements. And the depletion is stronger when the temp condensation temperature is, uh, is larger. And because the post-AGB star has lost all of its uh, atmosphere, we think that it re uh, part of the of the of the matter from the circumbinary disk onto the surface on its surface and its surface becomes dominated by this reaccreted uh, matter and somehow the dust is trapped in the disk and only the, uh, the depleted gas will accrete onto the central star that's why we still have all the volatiles here but we uh, are a uh, depletion of uh, refractory uh, elements and so I will come back to that because the origin of, of this depletion was uh, um, not entirely settled and we start to have some clues on why uh, it happens. And yeah, I forgot to say here that if when we measure the uh, abundance of iron uh, over uh, hydrogen, it does not trace the metallicity of the target but that is washed out by this mechanism, but we are really tracing the depletion of refractory elements compared to the compared to the volatiles. And we see this depletion in many different post-HV binaries, but the strength varies from target, uh, uh, from target to target. And so uh, we are we do not understand yet uh, what is the what is the mechanism behind it, but I'll show you that we uh, start to have some clues and there is a link between the depletion and the structure of the circumbinary disk. All right, and so these targets were mainly uh, studied for um, stellar evolution. So because they are, they are a product of binary e uh, evolution, they are due to a very strong binary interaction that happens on, when one of the stars is a giant. Uh, so there's recreation of mass 
acidity come to the central star, but there is also uh, exchanges of angular momentum. You have this very uh, interesting chemical properties on the surface of the post AGB star. And they may be uh, the progenitors of planetary nebula, those bipolar planetary uh, nebula that are thought to be due to the uh, uh, companion. But today I want to talk about these disks from a point of view of planet formation. Um, and I think that the disks are very interesting to study because they can bring some constraints on, on planet formation also around young stars. And here I give you some examples why it could be this, the, the case. So for example, you can really constrain the time scales of plant formation processes, such as grain growth or formation of the substructures in the disk. So we start to see in young stars that the protoplanetary disks that are uh, roughly older than 1 million years, so that are uh, called the class two here, are not massive enough to produce the observed exoplanetary uh, systems. However, there is enough mass in a very young um, uh, protoplanetary these very young stars uh, that are called class zero and class one. So this means that plant formation must start very, very early. So less than one million, a fraction of a million here in this system. There are also other uh, indices in this, for example, in the substructures that start to be detected very, very early uh, around young stars. And we know that the post the disk around post AG binaries are probably very short lived because of the evolution of the post-AGB star, that is thought to be very short, but also because we detect this queen at very large scale. And uh, uh, if we model the, the, the mass uh, lost from the disk, we can, uh, we can uh, work out the, the lifetime of, of such a disk that would be a fraction of a million year. Um, and so if we see any processes happening in this disk, they must happen in a very short uh, time scale. So there is a good way to constrain the time scale of different uh, processes happening in these disks. Another, another example is that we start to see in young stars that there are indices for uh, late infos um, from the environment of the young stars. Of course, the young star is in, uh, in a star forming region. There is a, a, a lot of uh, matter around it. And, uh, sometimes there are late infos onto the central disk that can favor uh, planet formation. And so here, if, if we see any structures in this disk, we cannot invoke this late info. So it should be due to some, something else. So we can uh, test the impact of, of, uh, or the uh, impact of the environment or of the lack of the environment. We can also see if there is, uh, what is the influence of a planet in a disk um, because we think that the plant will disturb the disk and will, um, uh, will uh, favor further planet formation. And here we can expect that first generation planets could have survived the giant phase if they are in a wide, uh, um, uh, wide enough orbit. And they can, from the start, from the uh, formation of the circumbinary disk, disturb it and uh, um, yeah, and, and uh, um, make some, uh, some perturbation to the disk. So there are, of course, other uh, examples, but I think those are very uh, already very interesting to, uh, to investigate. And so I started to investigate those targets from the observational point of view. And uh, 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 to do that, we need to uh, understand the scales that we are uh, looking at. So the separation between the two stars, the inner binaries, uh, more, more or less one astronomical unit. The disk inner rim radius is at 10 astronomical units uh, in diameter. So it's relatively far because the post AGB star is very luminous. So it will push uh, the dust sublimation radius relatively far from the central binary. And the outer radius is not yet well constrained in dust at least. And we think that is around 100 or 200 astronomical units. But the typical distance uh, to this target is one kiloparsec. So it means that one square unit is actually one milli arc second on sky. So we really need high angular resolution to resolve the disk and to, uh, uh, to resolve the disk structures. And to do that, we uh, use infrared, uh, we can use interferometry. And so we can use it in the, in the different parts of the, of the, of the spectrum. So in the, to probe all the wavelengths, to cover all the wavelengths where we have the emission, thermal emission from 
the disk. So in the near infrared, we can use a Pioneer and Gravity on the VLTI to probe the inner binary and the disk inner rim. In the mid infrared at 10 micron, we can use MIDI and Matisse uh, to probe the inner regions of the disk. And the submillimeter and millimeter, we can use ALMA to probe uh, the whole disk structure uh, all to the outer, uh, up to the outer parts. And we can also use actually sphere in the polarized uh, uh, mode to uh, probe the scattered light on the surface of the disk in the, in the outer regions. So we have now all the tools, all the instruments to actually observe uh, this disk and to get uh, a good idea of the structure and to constrain our models. And so today I will mainly focus on the near and mid infrared observations of this disk, but I will come back to the, to the whole, uh, to also to ALMA and to Sphere uh, at the end uh, of the talk. All right, so this is a quite a long introduction. And now I will, uh, I will uh, start on the results. I will focus first on one target that we studied uh, a lot uh, to uh, uncover its uh, structures, mainly in the, in the very inner regions. Then I'll go to the infra infrared interferometric surveys to see if this one single target is representative of the whole population of a larger population of the small stage disks. Then from what we know from this in interferometric surveys, uh, we started to interpret the spectral energy distribution of all the post-AGB disks that we know of uh, in the galaxy and uh, with some very exciting results. And I will end up with some observational perspectives and the work in progress on those targets. Okay, so let's start by focusing on one single tag target, uh, RS08. Uh, so RS08 is a post-AGB binary for a period of five, Hundred days, you can see here the radial velocity curve. There is an eccentricity of uh, 0.2, and it has a very nice disk-like SED with the infrared excess starting already in the near infrared. Um, and we used a VLTI Pioneer to uh, observe uh, this target uh, a lot to to be able to get an image reconstruction. And so, if you apply a very simple uh, monochromatic image reconstruction, this is the image that we get. We mainly see the post HB star that contributes to roughly 50 to 60 percent of the emission in the near infrared. But if you remove uh, the, the emission from the star in the Fourier space, taking into account the different temperatures between the star and its environment, with the sparkle approach, we reveal the circumbinary, uh, circumstellar environment of these targets. And so there are two things that we see. First of all, we see a point source that is very close to the post AGB star. And this is, uh, uh, we think that this is at the location of the secondary, but it cannot be the secondary itself because it is thought to be a main sequence star. So it will not be bright enough to be detected. But what we think we see is actually the circum, the accretion disk around the secondary star. And we think that because we also detect uh, jets coming from the secondary star. So it, uh, it, uh, it would be quite logical to see the circumsecondary accretion. What we also see is that we have this ring, circumbinary ring here, and this is the disk inner rim in dust. So we can measure its temperature, it's around 1100 K, that is relatively close to the dust uh, sublimation radius for uh, silicates. We can also remove the secondary from the, from the image and we, uh, obtain a better view of the circumbinary disk. And we see that uh, it starts at roughly eight astronomical units. And what we can also see is that there, there are some asymmetry, azimuthal asymmetries uh, on, uh, in this image. And so what we think is happening, so there, there is two, uh, two maximas here. So there is one maximum here that is very close to the side where the post AGB star, so the most luminous star is. So we think this is an effect uh, due to the illumination from the primary. But we also see the second uh, maximum here that could be due to disk binary dynamical interaction. So maybe a spiral that is coming from, from the inner binary. But the origin is still uh, not clear yet. Nevertheless, we wanted to see if a radiative transfer model of a protoplanetary disk can reproduce the data. And we, uh, our attempt were, uh, was uh, successful. So we used the MCMAX radiative transfer codes 
And uh, you can see that you can reproduce both the spectral analogy distribution. So here the model is in, is in black. You have the deradiant photosphere here uh, in, uh, in a gray. And here you have the visibilities, which is the interferometric observable of the target. And you have both the data and the model that are uh, uh, on the same plot here. And you see that there is a very uh, little difference. And what we put in the model is that we have a surface uh, density uh, that is increasing in the inner regions and then decreasing in the in the outer regions. And so we need that to really produce the data. And it mimics like a very smooth transi transition at the inner uh, inner disk rim. We can also estimate the dust mass, but very, very roughly estimate the dust mass, which is more or less 10 to the minus three solar masses. That is also in agreement with what is found from uh, millimetric uh, uh, observation. So there are, these disks are massive enough uh, to uh, potentially uh, form uh, planets. Okay. Um, and so we continue to observe this target with actually all the instruments that are now at the VLTI, so at the Very Large Telescope Interferometer. So we had Pioneer at 1.5 micron, Gravity here at 2.2 microns, uh, and Matisse in the mini infrared at 3 and 10 microns. And you can see here the visibilities on the target, and this is the, um, the image of the best fit model. And you try to fit diff two different families of models, a Gaussian ring with a single temperature, and a disk uh, model with a temperature gradient with a radius, with a power law. And we found that for the new infrared, the Gaussian ring with single temperature is better to reproduce the data. And in the mini infrared, the disk with temperature gradient is better to reproduce the data than the other model. And our interpretation is that what we see is that we do not have a thin, a geometrically uh, thin disk, but there is a, a vertical extension that makes a larger emitting surface at the disk in a rim. So in the near infrared, that's why we are better fitted with this uh, Gaussian ring. And then in the mini infrared, we see more the temperature gradient that you have in the inner parts of the disk. Of course, this is just geometrical modeling. And now we are, uh, so this is the work of a PhD student at, uh, at Leuven. And now uh, she's uh, focusing on, um, on fitting the radiative transfer model to all the data simultaneously to get very constraints on the disk um, uh, inner structure. Okay, so now we know quite well the geometry of the inner parts uh, of the inner of the second binary disk and the binary for RS08. And now we wanted to see if this geometry is actually uh, found around other targets as well. And so we made a survey in both near infrared and mid infrared of those uh, of those post HGB disks, but in snapshot mode. So it means that we were not able to reconstruct images, but we fitted geometrical models to the to the data to get an idea of the different sizes and temperatures that we that we see. And so we targeted 23 uh, objects in the near infrared with, uh, with uh, Pioneer. So we are sensitive to the disk in the rim and the, and the binary. And we uh, fitted uh, geometrical uh, models with uh, incre increasing complexity. And then we have um, we had a, a statistical way to differentiate what is the model that reproduced best the data without overfitting it. So we had a metric with a penalty for number of parameters in the, in the models. And so I'll show you the three main results of the study. The first one is that the inner rim is set by the dust sublimation uh, uh, radius. And we see that in this plot, which is the size luminosity plot, and that is well known for lunar objects, when the size of the circumstellar or second binary uh, disk in a rim is proportional to the square root of the luminosity. And so here in blue, you have the young star objects, and in purple, you have the post HGBs that are spanning a larger, uh, larger uh, uh, stellar luminosities. And you see that the relation is conserved, even though there is a slight shift between the two targets that may be due to the different dust mineralogy or different uh, gas density. The second uh, result that we had is that the radial disk profiles are continuous for most of the disks. And we did that by uh, comparing the sizes in the new infrared here on the x-axis with the sizes uh, uh, in the mid infrared at 10 micron in the y-axis here. And we compared that with a very simple models of, 
of disk with that have a temperature parallel uh, with a radius. And you have a, if you have a continuous disk profile, you will be in this yellow area here. And you can see that most of the targets are uh, indeed in this area that are compatible with a continuous radial disk profile. Of course, there are some um, outliers, but, but most of the targets are compatible with this kind of geometry. And the last conclusion is that the targets are very, very complex, even with very few uh, data points. And so we uh, find, find that by uh, seeing what, what are the models uh, that are preferred to reproduce the data or that are needed to reproduce the data. And we saw that more than half of the targets need models that, are, that uh, have uh, 10 or more uh, parameters. So it means that uh, even if we are able to get the size out of the observation, we may be model biased uh, by, um, by this kind of uh, geometrical model fitting. And we need to go for image reconstruction to get uh, uh, an unbiased uh, view of the targets. And this is what we started. So we started a large program on the, on the VLTI um, that is called INSPIRING, that stands for Interferometric Survey of post Binaries with the Ring. And it consists of uh, 250 hours of observations in the near infrared with Pioneer uh, and Gravity to have 11 images uh, of, those, uh, of those targets. So the main goals are to get the structures of the circumbinary um, environment of the stars and see how it evolves with binary phase, but also see if we detect the secondary or the second secondary accretion disk. And so we, the methodology is to start from image reconstruction, uh, then to go to geometrical models, uh, modeling, and the models will be inspired by the images that we, that we got. And then we'll switch to radiative transfer modeling to really get the uh, final, the, uh, the properties, uh, physical properties uh, and the inner regions of this disk. So despite uh, the, the, um, the COVID, uh, the large program is still going on. So it was interrupted, but we started to have the first uh, images that I can show you today. Uh, so we also, I forgot to say that we developed um, a new image reconstruction algorithm using uh, neural networks that I don't have time to develop now, but we uh, managed to obtain the images of different targets. So you see that there are these that are inclined, there are these that have there are images where there are the double ring morphology, as we can see here. There are also these that are inclined. We see the secondary in the object, but there is a very complex structure in the in the infrared that we uh, need to understand yet. And we also have several epochs on the IRAS-08, so the object that we studied, and we redetect the secondary at different position, and we also see that the um, emission morphology of the circumbinary disk changes with orbital phase. And so that's very exciting because we will be able to, to study, study that uh, in detail. And to compare, this, this are the images uh, that, we, uh, that we obtain with the VLTI on young stars, on the disk on young stars, on the Herbig stars that are intermediate mass young stars. And you see that despite them being uh, closer to, to us, uh, we are less able to resolve the inner uh, disk uh, structure or the sublimation region uh, around the spot of planetary disk. So they are so luminous that we can still see uh, the, the, the sublimation region in post HGD disk. All right, now knowing, uh, having all this information from this in interferometric observations, we can start to interpret the spectral energy distribution uh, of these uh, disks and uh, look for uh, to make some statistical analysis of the of the um, uh, infrared uh, excess uh, morphologies. And so these are the results that were accepted uh, just a few weeks ago. So they are very very new. Uh, and so we can see here. Uh, two spectral energy distribution of two different post AGB binary systems. And you can see that you have, so the IRS-08, where the infrared excess starts in the near infrared. So this is the flux and the wavelengths. And this is uh, compatible with a full disk with the inner, uh, inner radius starting at the dust sublimation radius. And we have also targets that have uh, an infrared excess that starts only at three, five, or even later at 10 microns. 
And we interpret that uh, as a disk with an inner hole. And so these systems are known also around young stars and they are called transition disks. And we think that we see analogs of this transition disk on the post tgb binaries. And the size of the inner rim of this disk was actually confirmed with mid-infrared uh, observation with MIDI. We find that the inner rim is at 34 astronomical units, that is seven times the theoretical dust sublimation radius around this star. So I want to see that all the targets may be like transition disk uh, uh, in, the, in the galaxy. And so to do that, we classified the targets using a color-color diagram. And so we use the near infrared color and the mid infrared color. As you can see here, the two systems will have uh, different uh, values of those, those two colors. So here, the full disk will have a high value, uh, ha higher near infrared color, whereas the transition disk will have a higher mid infrared color. And so we put all the 85 targets in this color color diagram. So you have the near infrared color here in the y axis and the mid infrared color here in the x axis. And you can see that uh, this, uh, the, all the targets are not randomly distributed in this plot. So there, there is some structure. And we see that the full disk of RSO8 is here in the bulk of the distribution, let's say. And uh, the transition disk of AC her is here on the bottom right uh, corner of this plot. And we wanted to compare that to some uh, synthetic population of disks uh, that we built using uh, radiative transfer uh, models. Uh, so we made radiative transfer models of full disk and also radiative transfer models of transition disk. And you can see that in this plot, they actually do not uh, overlap that much. So we can, um, we can differentiate between these two types of disk in this color-color uh, diagram. And to go further, we uh, needed to make some uh, statistics on some different groups. And so we defined some categories that are arbitrary defined, but still based on the distribution of models in this uh, color color uh, diagram. And so these are the categories that we, uh, that we made. So here we have uh, the category uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I will go through all these uh, uh, categories now, just to show you what we can uh, learn about uh, uh, these uh, uh, this targets. And what we did is that we uh, built a median, um, um, median infrared excesses for all the targets. So here, this is the median infrared excess for all the targets all together. They are normalized at one micron. Um, and you have the, the median and the 25th and 75th person, percentile here. And so if you take category uh, one, you see that the, you will see very soon, that it will overlap with this uh, median spectral energy distribution. Okay, so this is most of the targets are consistent with a disk, a full disk structure. And also, this category zero targets that have a very strong near infrared excess, and this is uh, probably due. So this is the median uh, infrared excess, and this is probably due to the fact that they are all inclined systems. So the central star are obscured by the disk, and this is how we have a very strong infrared excess compared to the uh, to the visible. Actually, we know that uh, most of these targets are actually edge-on. So here we can find a red rectangle, for example, where we see the disk is like that. It's obscuring a bit the, the central star and air poop where we see the, the disk here, the shadow from the disk. And this is the surface uh, of, the, of the second binary disk. We have also category two targets where there is no near infrared excess, but very strong mid infrared excess. And so this is those uh, uh, transition disks or disks with the large cavity, where the inner rim is receiving all the photons from the star, it's heating up uh, more than if, if it was a continuous disk. And that's why the emission in the mid infrared is larger because it will puff up and the sur emission surface will be larger as well. Then we have the category three targets where we have a uh, a weak mean infrared emission, but also uh, a relatively um, a common mean infrared emission. We think that here we have a mix between full and transition disk. And at the end, we have targets where the very long wavelengths, so we have very large cavities, or maybe we have uh, some analogs of debris disks in, uh, in this, uh, this target. So debris disks are disk, all disks without uh, gas around uh, young stars. 
All right, and so if we summarize, this is what we get for each category. The different infrared excesses, yes, here we go. And so we see that they are relatively uh, different from each other. And actually this color color plot is uh, really good in trying to uh, make sense or differentiate the different type of infrared excesses that we find around post aging binaries. So the first result that we can have from this kind of observation is that uh, there are transition this, so this with large cavity around 10% of our uh, targets. So that's also very interesting because we have more or less the same proportion of transition this around young stars. So there is probably the same mechanism that is acting uh, in the disk around post AGB uh, binaries. But another result that we have is that there is a link between uh, the iron uh, abundance that is here not tracing the metallicity actually, but the depletion of refractory materials and the category of the, of the disk. So disk with uh, large uh, cavities are more depleted by a factor of uh, 100 uh, than the, uh, the full disk uh, targets. And so that's very interesting because um, it means that there is a link between the presence of a cavity and the depletion of refractory materials uh, into, on the surface of the post AGB star. And so it, there is probably a mechanism that is making both the cavity and the depletion of the refractory material. And one such a mechanism, and in my opinion is the most likely, is that we have a planet in the disk that is massive enough to trap the dust uh, in the outer parts of the disk, but still not uh, too massive to let the gas uh, accrete onto the central, uh, central star. And we actually uh, see the same kind of, uh, of link of correlation around uh, young stars, uh, around Herbig stars, but also around uh, sun-like uh, stars. And so if this interpretation is true, uh, then it raises a lot of different questions. So what would be the structure actually here in the outer parts of the disk? Is this planet a first or a second generation planet? I think that it's most likely, if it's true, it would be most likely that it's a first generation planet that is massive enough in that is present from the start in the disk that is creating that. But uh, it's a very uh, exciting uh, result, I think, that needs to be followed up uh, in these targets. All right, so now we'll end up with some observational per perspective on those targets. So I will summarize the similarities between those post AGB disks and the disk around young star objects, but also the differences. I will also add some more uh, points that I had no uh, time to, um, to, uh, to go through in this, uh, in this talk. So of course we have very similar infrared excesses in the spectral energy distributions. And so it means that overall this structure is very similar. So that we actually can model uh, the, um, the disk emission with uh, protoplanetary disk uh, models. Uh, and we see that the inner disk rim is ruled by dust sublimation for most of the targets, but not all because we also see transition disks. Um, the disks are stable as seen by uh, CO um, observations in the, in, the, in the millimeter in the gas. The disk masses are relatively high or comparable to what we find around young stars. And we see also uh, indication for dust growth at least to millimeter sizes or even more in some of the targets. Uh, and we have this population of transition disk uh, around, around the stars that is quite inter is interesting. The main differences are uh, actually the luminosity of the central star that is very high, that pushes the inner disk rim very far from the central binary, but also can exert a very strong radiation pressure on the grains that are on the dust on the surface of the disk. Uh, there's a systematic inner binary that is due to the way those disks are formed from the ejection of the, of the atmosphere of the, of the AGB uh, star. Uh, there is no influence from the environment, uh, there is possible interaction with the first uh, generation uh, planet in these disks, but one of the most interesting difference is the short disk lifetime that is really makes, I think, this disk a very nice laboratory to, to constrain different processes and the, life, uh, the time scales of the processes. There are also some unknowns as the presence of substructures within the disk. 
awesome disk warps or are they aligned or misaligned with central binary? This we still don't know. Are there some magnetic fields in these targets uh, that are shaping the ejection, for example? Uh, and are they forming se second generation planets? So these are all the unknowns. And we uh, would like to answer uh, this, uh, this different uh, questions. But I will put here some, um, let's say, some uh, hypothesis of how this disk could form planets. So core equation seems to be very, very long for the disk uh, time scale. But you can think about gravitational instability of this disk. Are they are they stable or not? Uh, this is something that needs to be uh, to be uh, studied uh, through uh, constraining the tumor parameter in this disk. So we did that for one target. I don't know, I don't know if you can see that. But the tumor parameter seems to be at around five, uh, so it's relatively high. But maybe in other, this could be uh, uh, less uh, stable. And we can uh, think also about table accretion. If you have a planetary embryo, a first generation planetary embryo that is still uh, in the in the system, and we if you have some pebbles that will go from the outer parts of the disk onto the central. Uh, star, they will be accreted very efficiently on this embryo and will form uh, a planet. So we can think about this kind of um, of uh, possible planet formation uh, mechanisms. But to do that, we need to constrain the pebble flux for, by the observations. I'll finish on the observational perspectives. So we are trying to probe that these structures are all different wavelengths and all different scales. So with the inner regions, with the VLTI, with the large program, and with Matisse, this I already um, uh, showed you. There's also, we also uh, made uh, small surveys with a sphere in polymetric mode to constrain the disk surface in the infrared, but also in the visible. And here are some uh, uh, images from the survey. You can see that there's some structure in this disk. We can even see some uh, bipolar uh, structure here in the shadow of the disk at the center. That is very uh, that is relatively similar to what we see around young stars. So this is one young star spin with uh, with uh, HST when we have a, a shadow here and and the two we see the two surfaces as we may see here. And actually now with uh, sphere we can have a better image of the same target where we really see the details of the disk structure. So we expect that in in few years with the ELT we will be able to make the same uh, thing with uh, for this disk. And we can also start to make the link between the sphere uh, images and the VLTI uh, images. So this is the same target, but at two different scales. So VLTI with uh, phi as well as unit, unit scale and sphere with the outer disk. And we also recently got some ARM observations to really resolve the dust structure at the very high angular resolution. And this is the image uh, that, we, that we got. So this is the very first image of the of the dust, uh, resolved dust in one uh, such a disk. And you can see that uh, the radius is around 100 astronomical units. We see some radial structure here. And this is uh, uh, all very exciting because we can now have uh, the whole um, observations to probe all the, all the structures from the disk inner rim to the outer regions on the surface, but also uh, in the mid plane. Now, of course, this is a very preliminary image. We are still working on that but we uh, will be able to, to have a very good constraints on the disk morphology. All right, uh, for the future, so it's nice to have all the constraints of the disk on the, on the physical processes that are happening in the disk, but in the end, in the long-term future, we'll be probably able to link this disk with the exoplanets that are, that are uh, possibly produced by the second generation binary disk, and we'll be able to do that with the ELT, that will be sensitive enough and that have a high uh, angular resolution to look for um, for plants around binary uh, binary white dwarfs. And we can also chase this uh, planets around binary white dwarfs actually with uh, gravitational uh, waves with uh, LISA, where they expect to find around 100 planets uh, with gravitational waves because the planet will just modulate the signal from uh, double uh, wide dwarf uh, binaries. And we can see there is an excess of planets around those wide dwarf binaries uh, uh, to see uh, if, um, if uh, also this uh, disk are producing planets or not. And I will end up 
uh, with uh, the conclusions. So I hope that I convinced you that those disks uh, around post binaries are uh, relatively similar to this around uh, young stars. And that studying them will, can also bring uh, constraints on the uh, plant formation processes around the young stars because we are in a different parameter space uh, that is not met around young stars and can test whether some uh, physical processes are also happening there and, what, uh, and if they are happening uh, in a different uh, way. And this is independent of the fact whether or not actually plant formation is uh, happening in these disks. We start to see uh, some uh, possible indirect signs of planet in this disk with the link between the cavities and the, and the depletion. And we started a thorough observing campaign to uncover the details of this disk. So stay tuned. We'll hope to have some, some results to, um, to show in the, in the few, few months or, or years. And so uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, what about the, uh, the system that you showed that so there is binary and and there, there are supposed to be two planets out there? Yeah, an answer. Yeah, uh, I wasn't sure. So, what the detection was actually by uh, following the transits of the, the binary, right? Yes, you do not see the planet transit. No, okay, so it's just the timing of the of the binary that tells you that there must be companions that disturb the yeah. And so my, my question is, if you do not see the the transits, mm -hmm. uh, because you have a big star, it's, one is uh, is relatively big, right? Yeah. So there's a NAND star and a wide world. But so no 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 this is this is uh, uh so it's uh so an answer is really after the post hgb phase so okay. the evolved star became a white dwarf already okay okay so, so it's very small okay so, so you do not have much constraint on the on, on the inclination no no so it's, that's why they are really candidates um and and so the the eclipse timing variations are, 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 I have to say that they are complex to interpret because there are several interpretations that are possible. The main ones are planets. Uh, and the second main one is the Applegate mechanism that can also change the timing, uh, eclipse timing variations. But for an answer, uh, this is the most promising target because the planetary uh, the model with the planets is really, has really predicted the signal. And since then, the this system was followed up. It was really following the signal of, of, uh, of these planets. Also, the orbital are stables, stable. And there are other wide world binaries uh, like that, where uh, it was also the time inversions were fitted with planets. But then uh, when uh, you make the dynamical analysis of the orbits are unstable, and then the prediction of the planetary model is not reproduced by the by the observation. So, so yeah. But for this one, it's the really the yeah one of the most reliable. But it will be nice to pro to confirm that with another technique, of course, uh, with DLT, for example, to really try to image the, the planets from the white dwarf. 